Hello, uh, my name is Catherine Van Arendonk. I am a critic and a writer at Vulture, and it is my immense, immense honor to welcome you to this year's honorary degree conversation and to welcome the recipient of the 2022 Vulture Honorary Degree, Lee Pace. So I want to get uh, the formalities out of the way first. Uh, Lee Pace, it is my immense honor to confer upon you the Vulture Master of Culture degree. Congratulations. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> I assume you'll be updating your resume immediately. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, take. Well, thank you so much for having me. Oh. It's so nice to be here with you all. It is our you. pleasure. Yeah. Um, how are you doing? Really good. Happy to be in LA. Yeah, it's nice to be here. I got to see some friends yesterday. And you were hiking. I was hiking. Yeah. I did do some hiking. And I got to enjoy the pretty weather out here. You know, it's the best. LA is such a nice lifestyle, it's such a pretty city. We love having the festival out here. We come out and we think, oh, palm trees, and it just is uh, a real treat to be able to talk with you and to have such great crowds, and we are so thankful every year, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I lived in LA for a couple of years, and this crazy thing happened where I wore the same T-shirts and clothes for the whole time, I listened to the same music, and two years passed, and I just have no memories of that time. <laughs> No idea what that happened. That sounds blissful. <laughs> That's why everyone's so happy here. They don't remember a thing. <laughs> well, um, I am really, really excited to be able to have this conversation because um, I have been watching your work for a number of years, and it has always struck me as such a thoughtful and um, careful way to build a career. And I think your relationship to the roles that you play, but also your um, relationship to having sort of so an online persona that I think is um, one that people clearly respond to, but is also retaining privacy, I think is so fascinating. Um, and I am just thrilled to be able to go back and talk about how you got here and how you made a lot of those decisions, which I think are so um, striking and such a really appealing way to be a celebrity if one has to be a celebrity. Well, I really feel like I'm gonna learn something here because I haven't put that much thought into it. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Excellent, let's go. Um, <laughs> So, um, so I guess if, if you could just start first by telling me a little bit about how you grew up, um, what it was like when you were a child, and in particular, how you first started thinking about acting and culture. How did this start for you? Well, I, I'm, a big thing about my childhood is that we moved around a lot. We traveled, we would be in a place for about two years and then move on, so... I didn't really have any friends, and a lot of my, the people that I connected to were characters in stories, in stories that I read, and then a lot of stories that I watched. One of my favorite movies that I have probably seen more than any other movie is Labyrinth. Um, uh, and I mean, so many other like kind of weird movies that I don't know how they like found their way to me, but absolutely made an impact. Um, and I swam for years. I was a competitive swimmer, and there came a time when I, I had a lot of damage in my ears, so I had to stop swimming, because I was getting, they would have to poke a hole in my eardrum every year to, like, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was so painful. So I had to stop swimming, and, uh, and I was devastated about it, like, absolutely devastated. I didn't... How old were you? That was right before seventh grade. So, and I thought, it's like my life was over. You know how it is at that age. I thought I would never, I would, you know, I was gonna die. Um, 
And my mother <laughs> responded by saying, well, you're real dramatic. Why don't you try theater arts? <laughs> <laughs> that's good parenting is what that is. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how it started. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember what your first, was your response like, yes, get me on a stage? Or did you think she was crazy? Well, that, we were in Texas at that time. And I, I still had a you know, very competitive spirit from, from the swimming. And so Texas will make anything competitive. And there were like competitive drama tournaments. <laughs> so I got into that and I fought like hell. <laughs> and were you doing like two and three person scenes? Were you doing monologues? Oh yeah, and does anyone here know about those tournaments? Yes, does, yes. yes, you know what I'm talking about. I can see the, yes, yes. So what you would do, you would compete, there would be debate tournaments and then there would be some drama tournaments alongside that where you would do about 10 minutes of a dramatic play or a humorous play where you would play all the characters. So you would be like, <laughs> like next to yourself. And then there would be like absurd. You would like show up into these classrooms and like in for like math classes, and one of the other kids' moms would be the judge. <laughs> A little biased, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. And you would just, you know, act your face off. <laughs> and so, you did the first one you know, of those and you like you thought Loved this, it. Yeah. I was in. I loved it. And then I got to high school and it was one of these really big Texas high schools that happened to have like a, a really interesting kind of advanced drama department where kids knew all of the plays that were going on on Broadway. We would pass around Stanislavski and Uta Hagen. It was the first time I, I read Angels in America because at that time it was, I think, just coming off Broadway when I was a freshman. So I like, was exposed to all of these other people that I had a lot in, con in common with or felt like, like an aspiration towards these characters that I would read in plays and feel like, you know, I know nothing about being, you know, a man whose marriage is falling apart, but I want to try that on for a while, hmm. you know. Yeah. It is, it occurs to me that when you're a high schooler and particularly maybe a high schooler who has moved around a lot, and then had the experience of showing up at a different school over and over again, or at least a couple times, and then saying, who am I going to be at this school? Oh, yeah, because yeah. that's exactly what you would do. Like, I had no friends last time. This is the time I'm going to get it right. And I would go into the hot topic at the mall and... <laughs> <laughs> please, please tell me what you bought from Hot Topic. Oh, something like this, probably, you know, and I would just kind of come up with this whole new person that I wanted to be. But, you know, the trick about something like that is you're, you're not fooling anyone. You're only going to go as yourself, you know. That's, that's, you know, that's the thing that a seventh grader doesn't know. <laughs> but, um, but I certainly tried my best, yeah. Is, that, is there an element of acting that's like that, too, that you're some, something of yourself is always... A hundred percent. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, do you remember any of the early roles that you did when you were in high school? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> well, one of the big glories was uh, I did, uh, do you know the um, Washington Square, the Henry James book? I do. We did the heiress for a UIL one act play. Uh, and we took it to state. I, you I, went to uh, state? We went all the way to state. We didn't win, but we went all the way to state. And I played Dr. Sloper. So <laughs> I was with like white paint in my hair and like, you know, all these lines drawn on my face. I see pictures of it. I look absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> but I was serious about that role. Yeah, yeah. Serious. And we, look, we made it to state, so... <laughs> It sounds you know. like you had very good reason to be very serious <laughs> yeah. about that role. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. It was so good. Uh, I do also did, we did a musical every year, and um, I did Crazy For You. Do you all know this Gershwin I musical? I was in the pit orchestra for Crazy For You in high school. At Klein High School? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I played Bobby Childs in that, which was very fun. I didn't know how to dance at all, and they kind of taught me tap dancing, but I kind of, if I would forget it, <laughs> Just shuffle my feet around, you know, acting. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, I um, uh, lied and said that I was also learning to dance, and that's how I got a gym credit in high school, was for being in the pit orchestra for Crazy For You. My mom is still mad about it. Yeah. Oh, she can, she can let that one go, don't you, you would think? think it's, Come on, you let would it think. go. Let it go. <laughs> uh, well, she shouldn't have graduated high school. We know. She didn't have a gym credit. Anyway, um, <laughs> what were your parents thinking? I mean, did your mom have a sense when she told you you should try acting that it might really, really hit? No, I don't think so, not at all. But I was, I was very determined once I started doing it. And I, I'm definitely one of those kids that was like, I didn't see any other thing. That, I, I wasn't good at anything else. I had no other options. I really didn't. Well, and tap I, dancing, probably not, maybe. Dead, dead in the water. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was just very determined. And, I, and I, I actually started working with the Alley Theater in Houston, Texas, and they cast me in some stuff in my high school year, my, my senior year, and so I stopped going to school and was doing that instead, and um, so it was kind of all I was going to do, and th they were, you know, probably really concerned for me, but I wasn't listening, <laughs> it was, you know, and they're very happy and kind of, um, they enjoy it, they think it's really fun, and they did then, you know, I think they appreciated my... Um, foolish, driven, kind of, I'm going to do this insane thing with my life, you know? I would guess when you got into Juilliard, they thought, like, okay, maybe he's pretty good at this, though? I think they did. At that point, they were like, like, because, you know, we didn't know anything from Juilliard. My parents are from Oklahoma, and, you know, um, I didn't know anything. I just knew that it was like this, you know, I knew some things about it, but I didn't, I didn't really have a clear picture of what I was getting myself into. I was a child. I was like 17 years old when I went. So uh, I think it was that competitive spirit that I was like, I want to get it. And I, I was certain I was going to get in. Wow. I was just certain. I mean, wow. foolish, it right? It seems like a little unfair to me that it then worked out for you. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not... I'm, I know. But. I was just like, it was the only school I auditioned for, and I was just like... Like, yeah. foolish. I mean, it's insane, actually. I was kind of pinning my future on that. I didn't, I didn't know how to do anything else. I was just like, <laughs> well. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> look, it seems like it worked out, so. <laughs> so. So then when you got to New York, was it like a massive shock to your system? Or were you like, no, it's just more drama kids. I already know this. I remember the drive from LaGuardia to Lincoln Center where, where Juilliard is and thinking it looked like Sesame Street in New York. I'd never been to New York before and I just, that's what I thought. I was like, it looks, this looks just like Sesame Street. Um, and then I didn't really leave Lincoln Center. I was, we would go see plays, but maybe I would like, I would, it was, that was, I don't know if it's still, you can still do this, but you could pay anything you want to get into the Met. So I didn't have any money, so I would spend a lot of, um, Saturdays and Sundays at the right, Met. Which is your favorite wing at the Met? <laughs> oh, what a good. The Temple of Dindor is pretty incredible. Yep. Yeah. It's a banger, that one. Yeah. I mean, the paintings, the impressionists on the, the upper floor. I mean, it's just like one hit after the next. Um, I always think it's interesting about going to the Met. And after having gone all these years, you kind of have these little paths that kind of tell their own story as you wander through it. You, like, you don't know what you've come there for, but... When you leave, there's like a real narrative of, of the day that you've had with these masterworks. You it's know? An, an incredible place, yeah. But I never left Lincoln Center. I mean, all we did was kind of talk about Chekhov and, you know, debate the authorship question of Shakespeare. I mean, that's really all we did. We were such and nerds. And do you think Shakespeare was a per... Like, do you think it was Shakespeare or many people? If we start talking about that, Look. we're going to run the clock out to zero real quick. What do you think? Quick. Oh, well, I, j I think there was him. There was clearly him. There was a him. Yeah, I think there was a him. Yeah. I think there's something really interesting about the idea that... There, there, there was an effort behind using theater as a tool of learning to this, you know, mass of people that, you know, wanted to evolve their use of language, their use of, I mean, there's nothing better than those words. They are the most extraordinary words that the English language has ever produced. Which is your favorite Shakespeare play? Impossible question. <laughs> um, 
That's what we're here for. I love Macbeth for 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 so many reasons. They would they would put on classic like throughout the 1800s. Macbeth was the the show that they would put on if the theater was in financial trouble because it would sell so many tickets. Um, I love that. I love Romeo and Juliet. I love As You Like It. Um, I like the the wit and comedy of that. There's such a confidence to the way those characters speak to each other and use language in such a layered, um, beautiful way. So I, I, at Juilliard, I had all this time to really, um, you know, inhabit those roles, think about them, talk to my classmates and my teachers who were so knowledgeable about what the rhyme means, what the scansion means, like how you can find the ciphers inside those words. Um, and what a gift that was to kind of have that little laboratory where I could, you know, just think about words and think about characters and think about how they fit inside me, you know? Uh, I haven't done any Shakespeare since. No Chekhov, no Shakespeare. Um, uh, someone needs to call Lee Pace's people. Uh, yes, I would, like. I, would love to, I would love to, but I'm very grateful for having had the time there to do it, you know? I did Richard II my fourth year, which was great fun. Yeah, what a role. Uh, so you were then in a couple of productions, and your first major screen credit is a Showtime movie called Soldier's Girl. It came out in 2003. Um, could you talk a little bit about that character and how you came to that role? Another thing that I was just certain I was going to get it. I was absolutely <laughs> certain. I mean, I, I feel like what I'm revealing in this interview <laughs> is a kind of like confident insanity. I mean, it's obviously a personality problem because there's no reason I should have been cast in that role. I had done nothing else. Um, so for people who don't know, it was yeah. the uh, movie came out in 2003 and you play a trans woman um, named Calpurnia Adams. It's based on a real life story about uh, a private who is um, murdered. Yeah, Barry Winchell was murdered in his bed. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you Beaten to death. Yeah, um, by his uh, bunkmates. Mm -hmm. And you play this woman who he was uh, romantically, I mean, he was in love with. Mm -hmm. um, it is a lot of a role for a first screen role. Were you, like, how did you prepare for it? Well, the, the preparation was actually interesting because there weren't many representations of trans people available at that time, and certainly none that wanted to do what we wanted to do with this movie, which was, I mean, she wasn't the butt of a joke. She wasn't, you know, some, um, she didn't, she wasn't punished in some kind of way for the choice she'd made in her life. Um, I worked very closely with Calpurnia Adams, who I played in it while we were shooting. She was there for the entire filming um, and so, so much of my preparation was just, you know, being inspired by her, trying to honor her, and, and mostly just trying to understand her, yeah. you know? And I, I remember thinking, well, I've, you know, I've transformed completely. I've just done it, I've done it. <laughs> I've transformed, I'm, I'm someone completely different than myself, but then I watched the film back a year later, and all I saw was myself. All I saw was myself falling in love, all I saw was myself grieving um, inside of, you know, a different gender and a different, um, you know, story, someone who was dealing with, you know, profound tragedy. Um, it was such an experience. And I didn't understand at that time anything about what it was to be on a film set. I mean, they were like explaining what the mark was to me. I mean, I, I, Frank Pearson directed it. Uh, Ron Nicewanner did the script. And they were such mentors to me about, you know, how to conduct yourself on a film set, what the work is, um, what the opportunity you have when you approach a story like this that really, you know, investigates a walk of life. Yeah. Um, you won a, a Gotham breakout for that uh, role, which makes absolute sense to me looking back at it, because I, I can believe that watching it now you see yourself, but it really is 
um, a transformative role. Uh, but I'm curious if there was ever any, as you were thinking about it, as a first role to the, a thing that you then were known for, um, playing a trans woman is something that, you know, probably not every actor would say, yes, that's a role that I immediately want to take. Like I said, I was just certain I was going to play it. I was just certain. And I wanted what was it. it about the, what, what was it about that, that? I found her fascinating. I found her fascinating. I found the situation she was fascin th that she was in fascinating. I found I was touched by the story of Barry Winchell, you know, a child who was murdered by his roommate, beaten to death. They found his brains like 13 feet away from him. It was horrendous. And I found that very moving and I, you know, wanted to honor him and be a part of the story. I just couldn't get it off of my mind. You know, when I read the script, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't stop thinking about the scenes. Um, I was, you know, I was so in, so fresh out of school and into thinking about characters and, like I said, I didn't understand the business at all and I wasn't even, I didn't know enough about it to even have a framework to think about it. I was just Instinctive. interested in yeah. them, like interested in Calpurnia, interested in what, you know, the, you know, Frank Pearson had to teach me about what it means to be an actor on a set, you know, what's, what's called for. Uh, so you next did a show called Wonder Falls with Brian Fuller, mm -hmm. uh, and then that transitioned into Pushing Daisies, mm -hmm. which is still, I think, a role that is mm -hmm. really, really close to a lot of people's hearts. I wonder if we could start, I think we have a clip from Pushing Daisies. Ned? Oh my God, hey, how are you? Good, uh, you look great. Um, do you know what's happening right now? I had the strangest dream. I was being strangled to death with a plastic sack. You were strangled to death with a plastic sack. That's probably an odd thing to hear, but I wasn't quite sure how to sugarcoat it. Oh, oh. You only have a minute, less. What can I do in less than a minute? You can tell me who killed you, so, you know, justice can be served. Well, that's really sweet, but I don't know who killed me. I went to go get ice, and I dropped my room key in the ice maker. And as I was thinking, that was dumb. As she was thinking, that was dumb. Chuck was strangled to death with a plastic sack. And then you touched my cheek. What's going on? Here? Just a second. Is my time up? I'm sorry. Well, thanks for calling me Chuck. Do you know no one's called me Chuck since... since you. I used to. When I lived next door to you, I had a cr I was in, you were my first kiss. Yeah? You were my first kiss too. You wanna be my last kiss? First and last, or is that weird? That's not weird, it's symmetrical. Chuck's minute of life was nearly over. The pie maker's lips went as far as they would go. He couldn't will them to go any further. And as a consequence, the funeral director would go no further. If you don't want to kiss me, it's okay. I just thought it might no, be... No, I want to. I do. I... What if you didn't have to be dead? So... It's from the pilot. I was a little moving to see that. Yeah. yeah. What does it make you feel? I just saw Anna recently. Really? Yeah, I visited her in London. And when we were shooting those scenes... Um, her daughter Gracie was learning how to walk, and now she's 16. Yeah, so it's, uh, I, in seeing that, I just think about Anna. Yeah. I adored her. Like, I adored working with her. I, she was, I've never met someone who loves life like Anna Friel. Yeah. And she came into my life, you know, at a time that, I needed someone like that in my life, and and she did for for Ned as well. Yeah. You know, what a, what a great experience that was. It's so fun to see that. I'm a baby. <laughs> I'm like a child. 
I mean, I wasn't going to say it that way, but it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so... A big stuttering child. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your creative relationship with Brian Fuller? Because it seems like it was something that was... You know, you worked with him on Wonderfalls, and, and then he asked you to be in this as well, I think. Um, and it is such a... It is a role that I think is how you became... Uh, most known. It is a thing still that I think people think about when they think about your career. I love Brian. Brian makes me laugh. I, I love Brian's mix of humor and heartbreak. And I, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I, I can see it in that clip. I can see it in everything he does. And it's, it's kind of where we meet. Um, so to get to play this with him was, you know, just such a privilege, you know, to explore the character, to, you know, it was such a creative time doing it. But it was also, um, I mean, we had a chance to have a conversation about that show uh, a couple months ago, and it seems like it was, a ch it's a challenging kind of dialogue. Everything moves very fast. Everything is, I mean, you're... Yeah, big network show. It was like a network show that they had very high hopes for. And then it starts coming out while you're still doing it. Yeah. And then the writer strike happened. Yeah. So we basically had a certain number of scripts written, but then our writers were basically picketing outside the gate that we had to drive onto the lot. Um, and we would join them for part of the day, but most of the time, you know, we all wanted to keep the show going. We wanted them to get what they needed, but we had to show up to work so that the show could stay going. And, you know, but then we ran out of scripts because the strike landed, it lasted as long as it did. We ran out of scripts. So that was a big blow to the show, you know, because like we were you know, gaining momentum and, you know, building an audience and we had to cut that, that season short. Um, but the weird thing happens when you're like, you know, on a network show like that and you're still making it and then people are watching it and then these kind of abstract numbers come in that somehow quantify the success of it, which mean like nothing to what you consider a successful thing, which is this is cool. You know, this is making us laugh. This is, ma you know, I feel really good about the work we're doing. But it becomes, you know, it becomes a different thing when it's on a network show like that. It's like a weird meta theater experience. Because like when you're, in, when you're in a play, you get instant feedback. So you can kind of work with the audience to have a good time. You know, like you can, you're all there together feeling the same thing, doing the same thing. But TV, it's kind of like you're sort of doing that as well, but you have no control over it, and it's uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a tangent. We don't need to go no, any it's, further down. I mean, I, You're going to take my degree away. <laughs> 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 it's too late. They took the pictures. You're good. Uh, no, but I mean, it, I, it's... Got 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting because... It was also sort of your first mainstream role. I, it seems like probably the first time that you were, fans became a thing. You're aware that there's like a, a lot of people who love this show very deeply, even if the Nielsen numbers are maybe not mm -hmm. reflecting in the way that, you know, um, they wanted it at the time. But uh, it, it seems like to go from a much more uh, insular Juilliard experience and then an indie, a beloved, but very small indie movie like Soldier's Girl and Wonderfalls, much though I love it, not a show a lot of people had a chance to see. And now Pushing Daisies feels like suddenly you're doing press, you're a character that people are obsessed with. What does that feel like? Yeah, I just didn't I didn't I didn't think about it too much to be honest. I didn't think about it. It wasn't a time that I was like I don't generally consume a lot of media, so I don't really I don't I'm not really aware of I remember like when I was nominated for the Golden Globe or or um or something, there was like uh, Entertainment Tonight came to set to talk to me about this and I was like, I know of this show <laughs> but I don't 
know what to do or say right now. <laughs> you know, so I was a real, you know, I should have prepared myself better for it, to be honest. I could have, un I could have understood that side of the business or I don't know. Anyway, yeah. you can't take it back. So. <laughs> You can't, but I'm, I guess I'm also, it sounds like you took roles that were interesting to you and whether or not they were going to be like massive mainstream successes or small indie projects was be utterly beside the point. And then becoming actually quite beloved and having a fan base is just a thing that happened for you without your trying to create it. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> that sounds great, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I really, I wouldn't know how to do that other thing. I wouldn't know how. People like, I do. Don't... I don't understand it either, but people do. Witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't know how to do it, but, um, but you know, not, I mean, we got canceled. Yeah. Pushing Daisies got canceled. Look, I, it's, you, yes, we got, you got canceled. It's, I'm still upset it's fine, but yes. Yeah. But, I, but at the end of the day, I always think about it as a win because I'm proud of the work. Yeah. I'm proud of what we made. I'm proud of the, um, I enjoyed the experience with those people. You know, in preparing for this today, I was thinking we're going to touch on a lot of different parts of my career. And the thing that came into my head was all of these extraordinary people that I've had the privilege to work with over these years. Um, these directors that have you know taken an interest in my interpretation of a role I you know I, I worked with Robert De Niro Steven Spielberg as I mean and I in thinking about doing this I was just I pinched myself thinking how lucky I have been to learn from these people who are masters at what they do we haven't given them awards but sure yeah <laughs> they've got they've got another one <laughs> Yeah, it's been a real, and, and definitely Brian, Anna, Shai, Kristen, Ellen, Swoozy. Um, I mean, it was just such a time doing Pushing Daisies. So it seems like um, that show ended, and then you move into this stage of your career where you are taking these roles that are really fascinating to me because they are these small characters in giant franchises. And it feels like that can be a role that you take because it seems interesting or it's a role that you take because you're like, yeah, it's a Marvel movie. You don't say no to the Marvel movie or it's a role that you take because there is something really um, appealing about working with the people who are already there. And yet it seems also so challenging to come into some of these massive productions and then be an actor who cares a lot about his craft and um, is trying to make these characters feel grounded. I guess I'm asking, um, are those roles that you look back on and you think like, yes, I am uh, very attached to those characters or is it more that you're sort of excited about the opportunity of working in film and in this much larger stage that you really hadn't had before? Well, I mean, they're, they're similar in the kind of space they take up, some of those movies, but they're like chalk and cheese. They're all so different than each other. The way that the filmmakers approach them, so, so different. I mean, so different. You know, the characters were so different. The needs of the movie were so different. Um, yeah, they, and they're big experiences. Lots of personalities, lots of you know, challenges, but, w you know, what I can talk about, um, like with The Hobbit, for example, which I couldn't believe, um, I didn't think I was going to be get getting cast in that. It's no, the first I remember, time in this entire story. I, know, I was just like, <laughs> could I be so lucky? Because The Lord of the Rings was such a, you know, I thought it was just genius. And I, and I, and I think Peter Jackson is a true visionary and he with the hobbit he was approaching that movie as an innovator he was he was um you know he was shooting at a, a, an accelerated frame rate he was shooting it in 3d so we were shooting with two cameras that would change the 3d ratio in the shot there were times that there's a scene I have with Richard Armitage in the, in the second movie where we're meeting for the first time and he's on one set and I'm on a different stage and we're acting at the same time. Yeah. 
and they're comping it together at the same time. Like, that's the kind of innovator Peter Jackson is. Um, what a privilege to work with someone like that. Not to mention, like, Ian McKellen. I did a scene on a giant elk with Billy Connolly on a giant pig. <laughs> like, talk about something I, I would never have imagined. I love I would that get elk so much. I it's know. such a good elk. It's such a great elk. <laughs> I miss him. Well, I we mean, should play. I have, a, I have a clip from The Hobbit, so we should watch a clip from The Hobbit. We came to you once, starving, seen that. Seen that. homeless, seeking your help. And you turned your back. You turned away from the suffering of my people and the inferno that destroyed us. Do not talk to me of dragon fire. I know its wrath and ruin. I have faced the great serpents of the north. I warned your grandfather of what his greed would summon. But he would not listen. You are just like him. Stay here, if you will, and rot. A hundred years is a mere blink in the life of an elf. I'm patient. I can wait. Oh, he's so fun. <laughs> what a fun role. Yeah, it's yeah. so, so much fun. <laughs> I loved thinking about him. I remember I'd just gotten my farm at that time, and I just was walking around, like, thinking about elves. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. When you're walking around thinking about elves, what oh, is in your yeah. head? Like, wh wh what does thinking about elves mean for you? <laughs> well, I, I believe in elves. Okay, and, uh, I'm going to need more information about that. Well, I've got proof. Um, and I've got personal, uh, personal proof. So when I was shooting The Hobbit, um, I mean, New Zealand, which is just yes. go. Um, but while I was there, because I shot for like three, three years, I'd go for a couple months, and then I'd go back home, and I'd go back. Um, and I would always go on a big hike, you know, where I would backpack and camp. And I did Lake Waikio Moana. Did you I do did Milford Pass? Uh, I didn't do the Milford Pass. Oh, you pass. should. It's great. I bet. Did you go? You went to I New have, Zealand? I have, yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Um, <laughs> but I did the Tongariro Northern Circuit, which is about a five-day hike that takes you basically up to Mount Doom, where they shot Mount Doom. Um, and it's extraordinary. Extraordinary walk. Um, but it takes about four days. Um, five days. I did it in five days. Um, and... I was, you know, going on this hike, taking pictures with my phone, taking pictures. And the second day, I, was re I reached for my phone, and I couldn't find it. And I thought, oh, fuck, I've lost my phone, and I've got four days, and I can't turn back, you know, I've got to keep walking. So I, you know, I would, at night when I was making camp, I would tear apart my pack, looking for my phone, thinking, it must be in here somewhere, it must be in here. Three days go by. I don't, the phone is just nowhere to be, I mean, I've lost you it. You just have a pack. It. It's not like it's hiding some other place in your, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I'm certain I, I'd left it back there. But I woke up on the last night, and it is sticking to my back. The screen is stuck to my back. Elves. That's elves. Is that not proof? I'm sold. I exactly. Was, I had doubts when you said, but I'm, I'm in it now. It's like I, a testimony that they exist. They said, son, you don't need that here. We're going to take that technology away from you. You need to think about other things. Look around. Be where you are. You don't need that phone. It will not help you. So they took it away from me for a while. But they're not evil, so they gave it back. <laughs> but they were like, don't go, because that was also the time of like hipstamatic. So they were like, don't go ruining, you know, Mount Doom with hipstamatic. <laughs> but tell me, do you, I mean, do, are you convinced? Yeah. You convinced? I mean, okay. well, thank you. I think we all, yeah. we're going to go home and really <laughs> think about every time we've lost our phones now is what's going to yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so you have this um, incredible scene. You were on separate stages that you were shooting this scene with Richard Armitage? That scene was on separate stages, yeah. yeah. They would, so he was, so that we, they could do the size ratio. That's the other thing. Everything is a, a, like a sleight of hand, like a magic trick on The Hobbit, because we're all different sizes and stuff. I mean, it's, there are shots on that that 
Peter Jackson is a true, true innovator. He invents like cinematic language on those movies. And, you know, it's re really worth a rewatch to kind of see those. There's that, that scene where Gandalf is in um, Bilbo's house and they're all handing him all different, you know, things. They couldn't shoot that at the same time, obviously, because they were all different sizes. So that's like all this extraordinary piece of choreography and props and, you know, yeah. it's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's not just like cinema, it's like, it's like a whole other thing that he's doing. So uh, then you do a, a little show um, called Halt and Catch Fire. Uh, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. I knew. Thank you all so much for watching. <laughs> yeah. um, can you talk a little bit about, about that show and what the experience of that show was like? Oh, my God. I loved making that show. Uh, well, we just had this incredible cast of people that we, I remember we got to, we started just, you know, the directors change on a show like that. So we were like, we can create a company of actors that can, you know, really do our work, you know, and investigate who these people are. And if anything, just for the enjoyment of that. Um, and we took those meetings really, really seriously. Um, and there was, uh, we would fight about the characters. And I was constantly defending Joe McMillan. I mean, <laughs> Carrie Bechet, God bless her. I love Carrie Bechet. Carrie Bechet was so good on that show. She was, and I did not have many scenes with her, but I knew when I had a scene with her coming up, I needed to be ready because she always came to play. She was always on, always so good. But I just remember being there and being like, Joe's right, and y'all are being unfair to him. <laughs> Like, y'all are being, <laughs> and she's like, he's a monster, and you're a monster for defending him. <laughs> I, would, I would get on the phone with the showrunners and just be like, this is not fair. You can't do this to him. You can't do this to Joe. Like, it's not fair. It's not right. It's like a child screaming up to God saying, give me my way. <laughs> give me my way. And yet it's so striking because... Because you can feel that in the performance, right? Because I felt it. I did. But that it's also so much of what Joe is. Yeah. Joe is railing against all of these th this unfairness that he perceives, that he is constantly wants to recreate the world as a, he's a, because he is so visionary. Yeah. And what's happening is that the cards are not turning up in his favor. And so it is really fascinating to think about you feeling the unfairness of Joe, and meanwhile Joe is then the world's unfairness. I think it's part of why that performance is so fantastic. Yeah, it was, so, and, I, and I evolved with him as he learned. I remember kind of realizing the foolishness of my kind of arguing with them about that. Because then I, at that point I realized, because also no one was watching the show. I was! Well, you were the only <laughs> one, unfortunately. Like no one, we didn't have many people watching it, so there was no pressure of a hit like of repeating something that worked because it wasn't <laughs> it didn't seem to be working it was working but um so we all liked it amc liked it and supported it and wanted to see us keep making it so I, at, at some point i kind of realized like this is not a show about winners this is a show about people who have the right idea at the wrong time who are unlucky who are um who are carrying the weight of a bad reputation. That's Joe. He's got a bad reputation and he can't shake it. No matter how much he wants to evolve, people remember who he was. Um, and that's, that's life. That's American entrepreneurship. You know, I love that show. I'm so proud of, you know, the, the, the point of view of humanity that we got to investigate during that time. That, I saw Scoot yesterday as well. Um, I saw Scoot, yeah. Um, uh, God, I love Scoot. The amount of time we spent driving around Atlanta bitching about stuff. <laughs> Just, he knows all the secrets. Um, Somebody book Scoot right now for an interview. <laughs> Um, yeah, we just, it was a really great time. But I would never describe the way I work as like a methody way. I don't even know if I understand what that means. But I, it always ends up happening. It always ends up happening that you kind of find yourself, I find myself kind of 
I don't know if it's me transferring onto the character, if the character's transferred it onto me. Right now I'm, you know, feeling very securely like the Emperor of the Galaxy, you know. It, it looks good yeah, on you, yeah. I'm doing my best. Um, <laughs> we have another season coming soon, so it's I'm cool. excited, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about that in, in a minute, but first I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you did Angels in America, which mm -hmm. is a, a show that you said you were reading in high school and then have a chance mm -hmm. to be in. Yeah, I did. I had done scenes, Joe Pitt scenes, Joe Harper scenes in high school. Yeah. yeah. Of course, I had no idea what they were about. And once we, you know, were doing them on stage, it was, you know, and then in front of, you know, 1,400 people, it was a... Uh, that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, was that play. I, I remember seeing it, and I remember thinking, as an audience member, mm -hmm. it demands your attention for so, I mean, to see just the full length of it. And then to think about what it is like to perform that mm -hmm. over and over and over again must take so much out of you. It, it, it was like, I mean, not to be corny about it, but it was like, it was like a spiritual confrontation at that point in my life to walk in the shows, the shoes of Joe Pitt. He is a beautifully, beautifully written character who is going through the fire. You know, it's like it, so for that that long period of time, every day <laughs> I was just getting the skin ripped off. And then he kind of is stumbling out of that play, you know, going through the greatest pain of his life into a transformation. And who knows where it goes from there. And I think that's the brilliance of Tony's conception of Joe Pitt, is that we, we see him at the moment of change, but we don't see what the change is, you know? Because I do, it could be very many things. There could be a very sad end to Joe Pitt. Or he could, you know, find himself on a dance floor and, you know, surrounded by his brothers and, you know, f find himself in a way that is, you know, redemptive. Who knows what happens? And that's for the audience to decide. The part that I had to inhabit was him, like, realizing that he is an unloved human, you know, and having to break the only person he loves, her heart. It was... It was torture, and it was like, because the play is so brilliant, it's immediate. It's like a, the, the train leaves the station, and it's going at like 200 miles an hour, and you're just like, each scene after the next, it's hitting you in the face. So it was hard, 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 hard to play that character, because um, is, it is a tortured man. A tortured man. And it got me thinking so much about, you know, this idea of, because Lewis condemn, condemns him for being, you know, a closeted man. But my conclusion coming out of that play is that a closet isn't a thing that people choose. It's a place, it is a thing that is placed around someone. You know, it is a thing that is done to someone. Um, and th those people who find themselves in a situation like that deserve our patience and gentleness. You know, I, I, I think about Joe in that way now, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, you know, at that, that was a, the same moment in your career where um, you then came out. Um, it was a, a New York Times profile, which is a, a huge moment for any actor but the times profile was also he you are in this play coming out and you have also recently come out um it strikes me as a really challenging moment to move through in your life and i just wonder looking back um do you feel like you have managed to come to a place where that feels more comfortable now well i never really thought i was in yeah. i never really felt like that was a thing like any kind of choice that I made. I was just, I always thought I was, I always thought I was. But anyway, um, you know, the media will kind of create, you know, its way of talking about things. I, you know, feel strongly then and now and 
would wish the same for like all my all the other actors I work with that you know I reserve my right to contain multitudes I reserve my right to um, explore all the different facets of humanity through my work and in my life um, I, I I think about was called to my attention. Have you seen the show Heartstopper? I have. It's so Isn't it beautiful. Wonderful? It's lovely. It's so so good. And um, and one of the actors, um, I think, just faced like a similar kind of, oh, I don't know, Tower of Babel about the whole thing. It's just absurd. But I look at him, and he's so great in the show. And all I think is, I want to see what else you do. I want to see all of the, the people you inhabit in your career. And I actually don't care about anything else. I don't want to know it. I don't, it's none of my business anyway. I'd rather take your word for it than kind of take a, you know, some kind of hot take on it, you know? He'll, he'll choose to reveal himself in the work that he does, in the way he interprets characters, in the way he chooses the characters he wants to play, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think um, as looking at your career, it has been so uh, fascinating, and I think one of the incredible strengths is uh, the opportunity to inhabit all these different kinds of people. And as you were saying earlier, that way that the role, no matter how much you wish you could transform yourself, some of you shows up in it over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and that there is something much more meaningful about that version of revealing who you are than you know, the way that press has to create story, wants to create these stories and the pressures of it. Um, yeah. It's like storytelling, I think, is such a important part of humanity. I think it is how we agree on our values. I think it's, 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 you know, you can imagine cavemen sitting around a fire talking about the hunt, talking about, you know, who really killed it on the hunt, you know, talking about who ate too much meat, making jokes about, um, you know, and in that storytelling, the tribe figures out this is who we are, right? Storytelling has gotten much more sophisticated now, but it is how we all, when we watch things in big numbers, which is like for The Hobbit, I, w I was telling you earlier that um, The Hobbit has such a relationship with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, the, the Lord of the Rings, and there are so many children that would come onto our set who were fighting cancer or who had recovered. And those movies helped them through it. And to think that Here's a child, I get chills just thinking about it. These children are, you know, having the fight of their life. And they're watching a story about these little hobbits, you know, walking into uncertainty and unimaginable evil, coming in contact with orcs and elves and dwarves, and finding a courage within themselves to rise to the occasion. This is important. Like, this is, I, I'll never be one to say, oh, I'm just an actor. I'm... This is a worthy profession. This is a worthy thing to engage in because it's how we get through moments like that. And it's how we together, like think during the pandemic, there we were all kind of taking in stories and reflecting on how we fit inside those stories, how we define ourselves around them, how they've shaped or deformed the way we think about our ourselves, our identities, our future, you know? This is crucial to us. We have uh, just a few minutes left, but I do want to watch a clip from Foundation, because I love Foundation. We thought the gene editing was limited solely to Don's person, that it was done after he was incarnated. But after more extensive testing, it seems they've adulterated the source itself. Then all replacement clones are no longer pure copies. When did this happen? We don't know precisely. Are you saying that I, myself, am adulterated? Possibly. Yes. And dusk. Empire is being examined as we speak. 
Thank you, Shadow Master. You may leave. different than Ned, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> That's range, baby. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. So you play, a, you play a clone of a lot of, you play basically yeah. people who are you. That's got to be a, like a weird challenge. Oh, it's, it's so fun. It's such yeah. a delicious riddle because um, he's the same person, but he wants to be different people. And, you know, and, yeah, and, you know, it's no secret on the show that, you know, I'll play many different emperors and I play a very different one in the season that's coming up. Um, he's, you know, very, very different than that emperor. And it's very exciting to see him then because I was in, I was in, a, in um, the other Cleon's shoes. So they're the, you know, the, it's the great kind of, um, like I said, riddle. It's like a puzzle that they're, you know, they're the same. Yeah but they're different, you know? And in which ways and how, and in what ways do they believe they're different, but they're actually just the same? Um, yeah, it's no, it's It's that same performance question again, right? Of like, the oh. thing that you bring to, like you try to be different people, but there is something essential about Cleon as a person that shows up over and over again, or are they actually very, so different that in their genetic makeup or something that turns them into utterly different people? I mean, it, um, it is such a, really bizarre and fun storytelling idea to, th to really be playing with those small changes between who they are. Yeah, it is, a, it's a, it is a fun idea. And it's fun as an actor to kind of know that that's one of the pleasures of watching the character so that I can make choices that keep that conscious, you know? Um, wow. Uh, we have just a... a minute left and I, I wanted to ask you, thinking back about um, how you started and where you are now, I am wondering um, whether there are different kinds of roles that excite you now than there were when you were in high school or if it is the same kind of challenge that you still really, really long to take on today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I actually read Washington Square on the flight over here. Yeah, I picked it up off the shelf and I was like, oh, this is fun. Um, and I read it on the flight over here and there I was reading Dr. Sloper and thinking, well, maybe one day, maybe one day. I you won't can have actually, to paint the lines on now? Yeah, I won't have to paint the Olive Urn then. Um, and um, so, because yeah, he's, he's very fascinating, but there are so many things about him that I just had. I, I hadn't lived enough life yet. You know, I, you know, the roles get better. They do get more interesting, more complex, because your life gets more complex the older you get, you know, I think. Um, so, yeah, I've definitely, I look ahead and I just think, that's going to be, that'll be interesting, that'll be interesting. But Is there a, a yeah. role that you long to play that you haven't had a chance to yet? Let's, let's will it into the world right now. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah, we are in Hollywood, right? It can actually, dreams come true. Um, what, uh, do you know who's someone I've always been fascinated about? I don't know in what way it would be that I could play him, but I, he, he means a great deal to me. My favorite writer, um, Walt Whitman. Um, I think he is uh, someone who is endlessly fascinating. Um, I'd hate to see the magic of him reduced into some biopic. But, um, but uh, in the, I always pray that there could be some form that I could um, work with those words. Because, I mean, second, it's second to Shakespeare, but, you know, he, he's the American master.
Well, um, I want to thank you so much for being here. It's been so lovely to talk with you. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, and please give a huge round of applause to Lee Pace. Thank you. Thank you. Another great conversation.